Our scripture for today is from the book of Exodus. The Lord said to Moses, cut two tablets of stone like the former ones, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the former tablets, which you broke. Be ready in the morning, and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai, and present yourself there to me on the top of the mountain. No one shall come up with you, and do not let anyone be seen throughout all the mountain, and do not let flocks or herds graze in front of that mountain. So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the former ones, and he rose early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him and took in his hand the two tablets of stone. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name the Lord. The Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness keeping steadfast love for the thousandth generation, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, yet by no means clearing the guilty, but visiting the iniquity of the parents upon the children and the children's children in the third and fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. He said, If now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, I pray let the Lord go with us. Although this is a stiff-necked people, pardon the iniquity of our sin and take us for your inheritance. The Lord said to Moses, write these words. In accordance with these words, I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. He was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He neither ate bread nor drank water, and he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Word of God, word of life. George Farrell, noted Luther scholar of the late 20th century, well, probably started in the mid-20th century, begins a series about the Ten Commandments in the Lutheran many, many years ago this way. If you were asked to list your favorite passages of Scripture, which would they be? The Beatitudes, the 23rd Psalm, John 3.16? How many would mention... Exodus 20, 2 through 17. Perhaps only a few. Yet no other part of scripture has likely contributed more to our culture than these few sentences. Just in case you weren't sure, Exodus 20 is the first listing of the Ten Commandments in the Hebrew scripture. Probably even atheists know something about the Ten Commandments especially with all the fuss and feathers about Ten Commandments on public buildings, on courthouse lawns, and all of that. Let's face it. Many people see these words from Scripture as heavy prohibitions on the good life. All the you shall nots, one after the other. All these things we are not to do. And who wants to live with prohibitions? It was finally when I was teaching confirmation class that I really came to understand the Ten Commandments as both law and gospel, grace and demand. Now, on the surface, that may sound like a strange statement, But teaching the Ten Commandments and all the thou shalt nots taught me something about grace. To see the Ten Commandments in a freeing way that I believe 
is what God intends for the people of God. Many years ago, one of my mentors, who I could tell just wanted to take me by the shoulders and shake me, but he didn't, simply said when I was having difficulty, Jin, you can find grace for everyone else. When will you find it for yourself? Since that was well before I was ordained, obviously it made a big impression on me. It's been part of my own spiritual journey. Around that time also, I was asked a question in my final colloquy with the examining committee. One student, 10 or 12 members of the examining committee. Is there grace in the Hebrew scripture, the Old Testament? Well, I took a deep breath, silently thanked my Old Testament professor, and described some instances like the lamb being provided to Abraham at the time of the sacrifice of Isaac. The care of God for Job and Elijah. And now, after teaching catechetics, I realize I missed a big example of grace in the Old Testament. It's the Ten Commandments, if you can believe that. I finally figured it out. The Ten Commandments begin in Exodus 20, I am the Lord your God. And then there's the listing of the laws, the thou shalt nots, the prohibitions. I finally got it. God made humanity God's own and then listed the way to live out that. It wasn't, here's the list of things not to do and then I'll be your God. No, God makes us God's first. I am the Lord your God. It is gift. It is the making of relationship. It is the good news. By the time we get to Exodus 34, people of God have really gotten themselves in a pickle. Moses had been up on the mount with God getting all the laws outlined, and there's a whole whew, chapters of them. He's been gone a long time. And the people go to Aaron getting frustrated, that stiff-necked people, and they say, make us gods who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what's become of him. So Aaron has them gather their gold, I always found it rather interesting. They'd been slaves in Egypt, but they had gold enough to make a golden calf. I don't know. But they make this object of their devotion, and here they are. They've already abandoned their ways, gone off on their own, and made their own representation of a god. So the Cliff Notes variation of what happens. God tells Moses what has been happening down in the valley sends Moses back down to take care of things. Moses sees what has happened in his absence. And Exodus says, Moses' anger burned hot, and he threw the tables out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. Eventually, Moses will say to the people, I will go up to the Lord and perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. So after great negotiations between God and Moses and much ceremony in the tent of the camp, we come to Exodus 34. And the covenant is renewed on new tablets upon which are written the Ten Commandments. And here it is. In this scripture, when we get that flat-out statement of the grace of God, a verse that's repeated so often in scripture. One time I did a study of it, and I forget how many times it's in the Old Testament. But this shows forth the character of our God. The Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, 
and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Despite the unfaithfulness of the people of God, God doesn't deviate from God's character. Gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And haven't the people of God over the years given him, him enough cause to deviate? No, but he doesn't. God continues to be gracious and merciful. God continues to meet God's people with love and grace. Even when, or maybe especially when, this stiff-necked people deserve punishment more than grace according to the standards of this world. Back on February 12th, Pastor Allen reflected on the law in the context of that gospel lesson. And part of what he said, I took his sermon that was in the pulpit when I supplied the next week, so I'm quoting, what sounds at first like a legalistic heightening of the law is actually a gracious broadening of the law. Jesus wants us to move beyond adherence to the letter of the commandments and to focus on the true purpose of them, the fulfillment of God's will in our relationships. When I heard that, I just knew I had to take some of that into this sermon. And then Luther says about the Ten Commandments. We have the Ten Commandments, a summary of divine teaching on what we are to do to make our whole life pleasing to God. They are the true fountain from which all good works must spring, the true channel through which all good works must flow. When we think of the law, we can probably relate to what Luther thought of as being the first thing that the law does, terrify us, because it reminds us that God has a standard that God wants us to live up to. When Luther read the law, he was scared to death that God would damn him to hell. But eventually, that was good news for Luther, because it drove him to the gospel and the grace of God. Ten Commandments are good news for the whole world, not because they're a universal pattern of morality, a good way for everyone to live, but because through these words, a small group of people, the church, the people of God, is enabled to live in faithfulness to Jesus as an alternative to the standards of the world. And then God graciously invites us to be a part of God's project of redemption. We are called to be an alternative society, a royal priesthood who intercede for and who mediate God's presence in the world. The commandments give us a pattern for living and that pattern is the cross, if we consider the way the commandments are organized. God to us, us to God, us to other people, our neighbors. God to us, us to God, us and our neighbors in the world. Now, if you remember your Lutheran catechism, those of you who had to memorize it way once upon a time, Luther's explanation are not just one-sided. We are to fear and love God so that we neither endanger nor harm the lives of our neighbors, but instead help and support them in all of life's needs. We are to fear and love God so that we do not tell lies about our neighbors, betray or slander them or destroy their reputations. Instead, we are to come to their defense, speak well of them, and interpret everything they do in the best possible light.
And because God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, we know we can live in God's love. God loves us first, and then all of life flows from that. I am the Lord your God. And that's all we need for now. Amen.